Hello and welcome. My name is Cameron Miller, and this is a reflection sermon for the third Sunday of Easter season. And maybe it's because it's National Poetry Month, and maybe it's because we just hosted a, a poetry reading here in celebration of it. But I'm thinking about the Road to Emmaus story as poetry instead of prose. It's uh, Luke 24, verses 13 through 35. Now, if we read that story like Faulkner or Clancy or Kings Oliver, by putting our nose on the page and sniff on the first word and follow it all the way down like a bloodhound to the period at the end of the story, well, we'll lose the scent, and I don't think we'll ever find it again. <laughs> but if we, if we listen to it as a, as a poem, like we did that delicious poem by Stella Nasanovich, Everyday Grace, then a word melody might just migrate in and out of the window like music from a passing car and hit us with an aha. Maybe. Now, I know this could be a stretch because of the way that many of us were taught about the Bible when we were children and even as adults. But if we read a psalm, for example, like it's a fortune cookie instead of a poem, then we'll probably get the wrong message. And if we read Adam and Eve as if it's a morality play, then we'll probably miss the music in it. If we read any of the Bible, as a matter of fact, thinking about it as a history textbook, we'll get nothing, nothing but consternation when history doesn't repeat itself. If we read Luke and Mark and Matthew and John as if they are the biography of President Jesus, we'll get it all wrong. It's poetry, not prose. So let's treat this story about the road to Emmaus like poetry and see what comes out. Here's what I heard when I treated the road to Emmaus story as poetry rather than prose. Eyes get opened. Eyes get opened. Eyes get opened sometimes when we want them to stay shut. <laughs> of course, most of us are pretty darn good at keeping our eyes closed as long as possible. But eyes get opened sometimes by others, sometimes by our own volition. Eyes get opened by love. Now, I, I do not know how God works. I do not know how to change the world. But I do know, and you do too, how people are made and formed. I do know about mothers and the kind of power they have. And I know about fathers and the kind of power we have. I do know about children and how they may come into this world with their own special DNA and personality that nobody can change even over time. But I also know that they are formed and shaped by the people who love them. If we want to open eyes and change this world, remember where our power is. Mothers have power. Fathers have power. Aunts and uncles and grandparents have power. Siblings and friends and partners have power. Teachers have power. We have within us, at our, at our very fingertips, the most influential power known to humankind. We neglect it, we forget its power, we get cynical about it, we, we abuse it, we underestimate it, we forget about it, we close our eyes to it. Love is powerful. You love me, <laughs> then I'm going to listen to you. You love me, then, I, then I'm, I'm going to watch you. I'm going to see what you do and how you do it. You love me, 
then I want to know sooner or later why you do why you do and think and feel the way that you do. Love is compelling like that. It, it draws us into itself. It matters. It really matters what the people who love us think and do. We listen and we watch the people who love us because usually we love them too. A two-year-old with a temper tantrum may not seem very loving, but, but even in the midst of the temper tantrum, that two-year-old is watching how we respond. <laughs> Otherwise, why the tantrum? If, if the tantrum gets her or him what she wants, there'll be a lot more tantrums along the way. Whether at two or 22 or 57 or 90, we desire to be loved. We know who the ones are that love us. And we watch and we listen and we think about them. In short, they influence us. That is power. Now, I'm not talking about control or coercion. Those are different kinds of power. While control and coercion have influence also, they are not as influential with changing human beings from the inside out as love is. <laughs> I learned many lessons, both positive and negative, from my mom, as we all do from one another. Now, she and I struggled. We struggled greatly throughout much of our relationship to find any kind of resolve, which I'm glad to say we did find some at the end. But while she may not have loved me the way I would like to have been loved, on some level I knew, I knew she loved me because I saw evidence of it. For example, when I, when I was a senior in high school, and I'm probably thinking about this because it's this time of year, I was apparently creating a lot of consternation among parents in, in our small school. I was the senior class president, and my best friend was president of the student council, and the two of us rallied the class into voting not to wear caps and gowns. I, I have no idea, actually, why we did that. Maybe it was just to stir up trouble because, at that time, conflict was a norm. In the end, the school principal talked us out of it practically begging us. A few years later, inadvertently really, I discovered that dozens of angry parents had called my mom to complain about the whole thing. My mom never said a word to me. When I found that out years later, I was thunderstruck because my mom was not shy about voicing her opinion or, about, or her anxiety about me or to me. But in that case, for, for whatever reason, I don't know, she did not try to deal with her anger or her anxiety or her embarrassment by asking me to change my behavior. Knowing her as I did, especially as an adult, I recognized that she had, that she had sacrificed for me. In that one occasion, she sacrificed her own comfort and her own well-being. And when I discovered it years later, my eyes were open. Love does that. Her example in that instance stayed with me and was powerful enough to influence me and influence what I did and did not do decades later as a father. That's what happens when we get loved, and especially when we get loved well. Our eyes get open, and once opened, we often, very often change. So apply that small and humble insight to an arena larger than a single relationship. Apply that penny thought to a community, to this community, to family and friends. The people we love are ripe. They're ripe for our influence. 
the people we love, especially the ones we love well, are predisposed to being influenced by us. The course of history has been changed many times by acts of love and by the accumulation of, of many small acts of love. There's no doubt one of my reoccurring themes in sermons is this idea because it seems so, so miraculous really to me. I mean the accumulation of small acts of love like influencing your family and friends to be repulsed by violence no matter who it's against. Small acts of love like like learning to shun the seductive titillation of media that will sensationalize anything because it's a prostitute for advertising dollars. Small love like challenging common assumptions about right and wrong, good and bad, just and unjust, as they are hawked with cruel interest by the merchants of greed. Small love like challenging racist, sexist, and homophobic humor when it is so casually distributed among friends and family who feel it's safe to do so with one another. Small love, like teaching your children, niece or nephew and grandchildren, to think critically about what they see and hear on television and online instead of simply absorbing it. <clears throat> Small love, like raising an objection when abundance is treated as a right, and squandered and wasted just because someone we know has the money to burn. We must not allow ourselves to rest in the feeling of powerlessness, as if there's nothing we can do to change that which is grim about our world. We have enormous power, one small love at a time. It's the power of compound interest that it grows exponentially over time, and each act of small love accumulates and builds upon the next and 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 the next. We have enormous power, and we never get to know in advance, and rarely even in retrospect, just how influential our small acts of love may be. But we can see evidence all over the place of how the economy of God operates and trades on all these acts of small love. Likewise, our eyes are opened and we awaken to small loves. In little teeny, tiny things like the breaking of bread and standing side by side as we receive it, even that opens our eyes. Or in a note of music, in a fortunately worded prayer, in a chance word spoken softly on the lips of a friend or an acquaintance, in an unaccustomed moment of silence while standing among many, in a robin's egg or spring blossom, some small moment of joy, in unassuming little tiny things, our eyes are open and we see anew we see freshly, we see things that, that are right in front of our eyes that we never saw before. In small love, in small ordinary moments, in small quiet whispers, the enormity of God's presence is made known and our eyes are opened. In small venues of the daily we awaken to the enormous power of our own small acts of love. And then, <laughs> and then we begin to see. It was the presence of love that opened their eyes in Emmaus. <laughs> well, I wish you many small acts of love that open your eyes and that also bring you peace. May peace be with you. Thanks. Mm -hmm.